Marty Atanyas. Welcome to another episode of Getting High on Anthropology. Today we have two guests, librarians from the University of Colorado, Rachel Stott and Kevin Sieber. Welcome to the show, you two. Thank you. Yeah, Happy thank to be here. Yeah, so nice. you produced, you wrote together an article called Cannabis is a Blue State Word. So we're here to talk about that. And I'm wondering first if you can sort of shed a little light on the kind of librarians that you are. I am a teaching and learning librarian. So what we do really is focus on um, information literacy instruction for students who are working on any kind of research project. Yeah, and, and the way that functions here is that we are faculty members of the University of Colorado Denver, um, but the nature of our work is such that we don't teach regular classes uh, where we meet with students every day or every couple of days. Uh, instead, we work on a model where we're invited by faculty to come into courses uh, where students are writing papers, giving speeches, they need help with, with research. Uh, it's our job to sort of demystify that process and hopefully uh, help them out with locating sources. So I have to tell you, I'm really excited about our discussion today because I've been involved in universities, whether undergrad, grad, or postdoctoral level, for many years. And I couldn't do the work I do without librarians and libraries. So <laughs> I just want to um, express my gratification for the work that yes. you do. We always appreciate a plug. Yes. <laughs> and, and so why is it important, when we look at your article, why is it important to look at the differences between cannabis and marijuana in terms of research and um, keywords? We teach keywords as a search strategy for students and part of that a lot of time is you know beyond identifying the vocabulary and the main words and concepts and terms related to their research question you also want to think beyond those and you know what are the synonyms and what maybe would this discipline use to describe that topic versus this discipline so that's how marijuana and cannabis came up for us so we started asking ourselves when using this question with students would the search results be different if they use marijuana or when they use cannabis or are they going to get the same types of things? So that's what led to our question around that because we wanted to know is it really important to be teaching them synonyms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so much of our work is trying to uh, encourage students to be thoughtful about the words that go into the box when they're searching. This is one of those things that as we've moved into online searching over the course of the last you know, two, three decades, uh, increasingly, we're conditioned not to be thoughtful about these things. We're, we're, uh, you type a couple of letters and search terms are, are recommended to you. Uh, and a lot of our work is, is trying to, in some ways, complicate that process so students are more thoughtful of the words that go in. Uh, and as it relates to this particular topic of, of students researching cannabis, uh, we work with a lot of college students, and this has been something that, that people in our line of work have been dealing with for decades and decades of, of, it turns out a lot of college students uh, are very passionate about the, the ideas of legalization or the, the potential benefits uh, of cannabis and, and medical marijuana when those were the, the terms that were used. Um, so it's something that we just saw a lot of the time in our day-to-day -day work and that inspired us to be a little bit more thoughtful uh, about how people were using these terms. So um, the article, the publication that you produce, focuses on a methodology or a method, a systematic literature review. So could you tell us, first of all, what does that mean? And then what are the steps that you took in the process? Yeah, it was a very long process. Um, <laughs> the basic idea is that uh, it's searching for information uh, through defined parameters of where you will search and the exact words that you will search. Uh, and the databases that we work with are similar to, to online search tools like Google, um, but they tend to have a little bit more uh, functionality that's transparent. So it's, uh, we refer to them as, as uh, limiters or facets. But the idea is that you're focusing the search in a very specific way in a very specific location uh, with very specific terms. Uh, and then from there, we ended up with uh, information for about 11,000 articles. And we sat there and read information. We didn't read all of the articles cover to cover. We just read like the title, author, subject, uh, and the abstract, which is a short summary of the study, uh, for uh, about 500 of them, 600, something like that. Yeah, about 540, I think. 540. Yeah, and, and one of the keys to this systematic review um, is that we repeated those parameters for every year. So we were gathering. Um, information about all those articles which we talk about in terms of metadata um, for every year so we could kind of um, compare through time and so we're not trying to leave anything out that's mm -hmm. part of there's several different ways you can do a systematic review but that was sort of the key for us is getting everything from that param that, that set time frame so we're talking about a lot of information, mm -hmm. and if I understand it correctly, you limited it in terms of years. So it was 1996 to 2016. Mm -hmm. So why those years? Yeah, we wanted to start, uh, we were looking at, uh, quite a bit at the idea of the politics around 
cannabis. Uh, and we started with 1996 because that was the year that uh, California legalized medical marijuana, medical, uh, marijuana for medical purposes. Uh, and then we pushed through 2016 uh, because that was a very political year. Uh, <laughs> and it was something that we were already talking about this uh, a couple of years before we actually started research on this, just that uh, this topic and the conversation around it had shifted quite a bit. Uh, it also works out that 20 years is a pretty good round number. Even though it was actually 21. And then it was 21 because we started 26 and, or 96 and through, through uh, 2016. Yeah. And as you were um, reviewing the information, there probably was a scheme of codes uh, that came up. So what were the ones that came up? And then provide a little bit of deeper knowledge about what patterns you found within one of the codes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I could talk about the codes that we, that we looked at. So we were coding for um, the sentiment which was sort of interesting. So was this talked about in a positive way, a negative way? Was it a little bit more mixed? We were coding for geography. So was the research done in the United States? Was it done internationally? Um, we coded for the application of the substance. So by that we mean, was this um, used for medical purposes? Was it used for recreational purposes? Was this a criminal focus? Um, was it talking about the use of the substance in a laboratory or an agriculture focus? And then we also looked at, um, what am I missing? Uh, the subject area. The ah, yeah. Discipline. Obviously, that's the big one. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what sparked a lot of this discussion was uh, anecdotally as we were reviewing uh, different articles, just talking with students who were doing research, we noticed that a lot of medical researchers uh, in a lot of settings, we're using the word cannabis to describe it, as opposed to in a criminology setting. Uh, if they're talking about the legality of the substance, they tend to use the word marijuana because uh, cannabis is an illegal marijuana is. That's, that's the word that appears within the criminal statutes. Um, and from there, some of the patterns that we went through as we coded these uh, 540 articles for all these different areas, uh, I think the, the most meaningful one dealt with the geography. Um, and in that sense, uh, looking over this 20-year period at all of these different articles, um, the word cannabis is three more times likely to be used uh, in an international research setting. So this is research that is happening outside of the United States, which makes sense because cannabis is the term that is used around the world. Marijuana is used primarily within the United States. Uh, and as it relates to research that was just focused on the United States, uh, marijuana was used three times as often as cannabis within the article. Um, but then separately, when it came to disciplines or academic subject areas, so different researchers in different fields, the words that they used, um, it was really all over the place. And I think it was really interesting for us looking at the field of addiction and substance abuse, that even within the same publication the same year, uh, different articles would use different terms. And that's something that I think uh, going forward we're really interested in because there isn't a shared um, vocabulary, a shared understanding of what word uh, substance abuse researchers should use. Yeah, it's interesting when you talk about the politics of these words, because there is this association of the word marijuana as being maybe a little more stigmatized and maybe not as serious as the word cannabis. And so when you look at the pattern of at the global level, you find cannabis being used three times more. Yep. It sort of says where we're at in the United States mm -hmm. with this ideology of sort of prohibition that still exists. Um, Rachel, I'm interested with you. Um, uh, we were lucky, students and I had a presentation uh, from Kevin, so we talked a little bit about you guys working together, and you have a background in journalism. I do. So, so how did that inform your work on the project? Well, immediately when we were talking about how sort of the um, connotations around these t words had maybe changed over time, my first thought was, yeah, how are they writing about this in the Associated Press guidelines? So the Associated Press style book is really the standard for a lot of media publications. So that was something that I had investigated. Um, and found that as recently as 2015, um, the AP was still suggesting to journalists that um, marijuana, cannabis, they didn't need the, their own entries. They just fell under drugs. Um, and then in the most recent edition from 2018, they have now broken this out and talked about the differences between recreational, medical. They have a whole entry on cannabis that talks about different parts of the plant. And they even talk about the international and um, domestic uses and how it's more likely that you would refer to the substance as cannabis if you're talking about it in an international context in marijuana if it's for the United States. So it was interesting to see that reflected in um, the style guide because the way that we talk about things matter all the time and if students are hearing things on the news or reading things in the news that are only using one term, 
they're going to be more likely to use that in their research and maybe they're going to be missing out on something. Well, that's really interesting. And yeah. I did look before we met today uh, at the 2019 AP oh, style, style guide, but I couldn't access it because I think it's <laughs> fee-based. So it would be great, for example, in the future to see what other new trends associated with these terms. Sure. So, Next time you hit a paywall, call a librarian. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I really, I really, help with that sort of thing. I really appreciate that. Uh, so going back to the, the codes, uh, was there anything that surprised either of you in, in addition to what you've already shared? when you th talk about going deeper into the codes and what you found? I mentioned earlier that our suspicion was that medical researchers would be more likely to use the word cannabis. Uh, it wasn't as uniform as I had anticipated. Uh, and likewise, on the criminology side, uh, there were more criminological researchers using the term cannabis, often in an international setting. Um, and as it related to medical researchers, a lot of them w were still describing it using the term marijuana because it was an article about mar medical marijuana as it had been legalized over uh, the course of several years. Um, so I think that there, there were still distinctions that were present between those disciplines and a lot of others. Well, beyond the coding, just how much more research has been done on this topic yeah. in the last six, seven years, it really, uh, between 2012 and 2016, I think it jumped almost 40%. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting and something we weren't really expecting to see. Um, and that was looking at the whole data set, the 10,000 plus articles. Um, yeah, and, and, and the preferred term, or the, the term that appeared most uh, frequently, uh, shifted in the middle of the last decade. Mm -hmm. So uh, beginning at the, the uh, the start of our research was 1996. Uh, at that point in time, marijuana was very much the preferred term being used in scholarly literature. Academics, when they talked about it, called it marijuana overwhelmingly. And over the ensuing decade, uh, cannabis uh, rose in prominence, and now it's closer to, I think, two to one cannabis to marijuana. Um, and that was something that you could see that there has been an arc over the course of the past two decades, that very clearly uh, the words that we are using around this, and I think the AP style manual uh, updates reflect this as well, is I think there's a lot more awareness and there's a lot more nuance in the discussion. Um, and I think that's what led us to this. Um, my suspicion, and I have there's, this goes beyond the scope of the, the study that we're talking about today, but uh, that uh, lines up with the growth of legalization and understanding. So I think that there is a political aspect to this. Um, that as legalization has spread throughout the United States, uh, starting with California and then um, certainly with Colorado where we are um, uh, passing Amendment 64 in 2012, um, has allowed for a lot more discussion and a lot more nuance, uh, which is really interesting for word nerds like us. Yeah, um, well yeah. I share that, uh, that affinity. Um, yeah. But one thing I think about the patterns with the last few years is that there's a parity being achieved with research that's a little more balanced and not just looking at the negative consequences yeah. of marijuana. For sure. And there's some words that I found really interesting or phrases um, uh, this idea of algorithmic bias so for lay people number one can you unpack that and what is the sig significance of this phrase in the context of your work yeah so that's that's a big one um, so this idea of you type words into a box and you get results has been around for a while but uh, over the last two decades um, we've become increasingly reliant on these uh, search systems, and they rely on, uh, on mathematical formulas that are referred to as algorithms. So an algorithm is something that is just coded by humans, uh, and in a lot of cases employs artificial intelligence to learn from user behavior. So there is an algorithm, a search algorithm, behind the Google search box, but there's a search algorithm behind uh, social media postings and, and basically everything you encounter uh, where you're searching or browsing or information is given to you on the internet. Um, and if you start to dig into how these systems work, uh, they're developed by people. We tend to think of the algorithm or the, the search as being neutral, or the thing that shows up at the top of the list is going to be the best result. Um, but these are all subjective terms, and, and people uh, apply their biases as they're developing these algorithms. And as algorithms learn from users who are using these different search tools, um, the algorithms will begin to reflect the biases of the users. So if you accept that there are racists on the internet, uh, and I will adamantly insist that yes, there are. And these racists use search tools, uh, and YouTube is an excellent example of this, um, where they post information there and they search for information there. As time goes on, the search tool uh, that is uh, distributing this information, the underlying algorithm, begins to reflect that racism. 
Um, and all of this, I just need to get a citation in, is Dr. Sophia Noble uh, of the University of Southern California. She has a book called Algorithms of Oppression. I cannot rec this, recommend this book enough. It is beautifully written. Um, and despite the idea of algorithmic bias, it's actually very approachable. Uh, Dr. Noble's an incredible speaker. You can Google her. I, she has a TED Talk. She has a TED Talk. Oh, I love that I just wanted. said Google Sophia Noble, and she's <laughs> critiqued uh, Google quite a bit. Um, and as a librarian, if anybody's interested in it, check out your local public library. And if they don't have it, you can use something called interlibrary loan. <laughs> That's great. I really appreciate the explanation about this algorithmic bias. So Rachel, I'm wondering with you, when you look at the work that you've done, um, could you tell us about, um, for example, what suggestions you would give to students if they want to build off of the work that you've done? Like what one or two steps would you say they should start to, to maybe pull forward some of the themes that you were raised in your work? Oh, great question. Um, so. I would always recommend you know, running multiple searches and being really intentional and thoughtful about what you're doing and sort of tracking themes you're seeing. So if you've decided that you really like one search tool, whether it's Google Scholar or the library's discovery layer that sort of searches everything we have access to more or less, um, try it and just kind of compare the results to see. You know, Taking that extra step um, will help you sort of contextualize what that research is saying and what kind of results you're getting. And I also recommend learning a little bit about the search tools that you're using, which is something I, as an information professional, still struggle with and have to kind of force myself to do sometimes. But it is important to spend a little bit of time thinking about how would this maybe work? And can I get into the advanced search features and play around a little bit with turning off some of these things that automatically search the synonyms? And just understanding um, that an algorithm is at play, even if you don't know what that algorithm is, because I don't really know that either. But just being able to think about that and sort of adding that to your critical thinking toolbox as you're evaluating information. Um, That's super helpful. Um, I know because of my, I did four years as a postdoc at UC San Francisco doing archival research, so I know the value of the nuances of these different um, online tools. But I'm also curious with the work you guys produced, there's some imagery and tables and visuals that are really helpful for the reader. So could you draw our attention to one or two of your favorites and what is the work that this table or visual image is doing? I think one, just as it speaks uh, broadly to the discussion around legalization, is just visualizing the states where uh, either medical or recreational uh, cannabis is now available. Um, and going back to the title of the paper, which is cannabis is a blue state word, um, of the states that have legalized for either medical or recreational purposes, um, they're overwhelmingly in, in the so-called blue states, the states that, that tend to lean more liberal. Um, of the states where all forms of cannabis are still illegal, uh, just about all of them, with the exception of Virginia, voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. So this, uh, as it relates to legalization, I think has introduced nuance around what words that we use. Um, the legalization is happening very much along party lines. And to look at a map of legalization in a lot of ways has a lot of similarity to uh, um, an electoral map from 2016. Uh, and I think that that's something that, as we were talking about this and, and discussing it with other people, that really jumped out to me. Is there an image or a visual image in the paper that you want to talk about, Rachel, that you found helpful or that you maybe have received feedback on from the different times you were able to present the work? Sure. Um, Kevin already talked about this a little bit, but I really do think that the geographic pie charts that break out the use of cannabis and marijuana internationally versus in the United States are really interesting because that was by far the most distinct difference that we were able to pull from our coding. And it's like you were saying, it really does show sort of where the United States is on their thinking with this and how they may not really be in line with much of the rest of the world. And one other one that I'd like to just mention very quickly is uh, the total number of articles published by year. It's, it's a chronological breakdown of the 21 year period. And it shows not just the shift in the word that is used within the, the scholarship, but it just shows an explosion in the research around this topic that's incur uh, occurred since 1996. And in our conversations, we, we've been hard pressed to think of another topic since 1996 that has grown by a factor of 10 or 15 of, of um, there were just dozens of articles written about this drug uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, and then within this decade in the last few years, now we're looking at 
Uh, hundreds of articles are being published every year. So with the ex exception of you know, cell phone use or social media, internet studies, um, I, I can't think of a whole lot of other areas where there's been such a proliferation in research. Um, and as an academic, I think that's only a good thing. I think having more discussions around this um, will uh, better inform people, better inform the students that we all teach uh, and work with. Uh, and I think that that will give us more answers to questions that a lot of people still have. As you were talking, it made me think about how there's changes happening now where even uh, the use of the word drug to describe cannabis, you know, p pretty soon we'll see at a high level changes where we talk about medicine. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of one trend. And then of course, adult use, which is another phrase being used. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I thought very interesting about the article, you know, it, it seems so commonsensical, but I think there's a deeper meaning. You use this phrase, words matter. And mm -hmm. it's really important, especially in the context we're at now the United States, 2019, we have some interesting drama at the federal level with our administration. Yeah. So I agree, words do matter. But explain that and unpack that in the context of your work. I think it's something where, uh, this is a lousy word to use, but it's the best one that I can come up with, is baggage. That the words that we use carry a lot of cultural weight. Uh, and in some cases, words are used very deliberately to express a political sentiment. Uh, words are used to praise people. They're also used to uh, erase people's humanity. Um, one of the examples we point to in the article uh, is we, we work within a system called the Library of Congress uh, classification system. Uh, and there are these things called Library of Congress subject headings. The important thing to know about that is any time our library gets a book, uh, we say this book is about, you know, it could be about a lot of different things, but really it's about these three things, and we assign subject headings. Um, these are assigned by the Library of Congress in Washington, uh, and they use the subject term illegal aliens. Um, and I apologize for using that term, but it's still the official term that is, that is being used by the Library of Congress. Um, there has been a push on the part of library professionals uh, to change that to uh, undocumented immigrants, and this has been reflected in the Associated Press Style Guide. Uh, and as well as just being a decent human, I think, in 2019 is being thoughtful about your words and realizing that in a lot of cases these words are being used uh, in a very problematic way. And I think, you know, we picked this topic of cannabis partially because of the giggle factor, frankly, that it was an attention-getting headline. I own that completely. Um, <laughs> but it allowed us to explore the, the larger discussions. And I think uh, this, uh, cannabis is a politicized thing, but there are plenty of other words that are very political and we should be thoughtful about how we use them. Great, we're yeah. running out of time, but I just want to end with a brief comment about how this um, quest for thesauri is the crown jewel. So explain what that means for viewers who are really interested to go deeper into the article and then maybe to have some action that they can take. Yeah. Well, I can explain sort of the concept behind this. So a lot of these search tools that we use employ something called um, query expansion, which really just means that they're automatically applying synonyms for you, which at the outset sounds great, right? You're doing a search for cars, and it's automatically going to search automobiles for you. Um, but that can be really problematic based on some of the things Kevin was just talking about. And you use one word, and you get results for something else, and it's erasing an identity. So knowing what those thesauri are and what those synonyms are that are applied in the back ends of these algorithms that the um, search tool vendors create would be really helpful. Being able to turn them on and off is something that we would find really, really useful as librarians and as teaching students with research. So we contacted one of the vendors who creates um, the discovery layer that our library uses. and. The response Kevin got was... Uh... <laughs> it wasn't great. So, the, the basic... so we have about 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. The basic idea uh, is be thoughtful about the, the words that you're using, but uh, as much as you can, um, try to determine who owns the tool that you're searching and what is their motive. Uh, because in our case, when we contacted a vendor in the, in the, vendor in the hopes of uh, improving search functionality and, and better educating our users, uh, they were not uh, predisposed to do that. Uh, but our vendor is a subsidiary of Goldman Sachs. So I think they have other priorities. So with some of your um, closing remarks here, a whole other episode could be just on this issue alone. Oh, so yeah. I just want to say, uh, Kevin and Rachel, really appreciate, appreciate the creative work you've done. And I'm looking forward to a follow-up or a subsequent publication that maybe takes the themes further. So thank you for coming on the show. You've been watching Getting High on Anthropology. See you next time.
That's it. It's over. On December 16th, 2010, the DEA made an unannounced visit to my apartment in San Antonio, Texas. The single moment that gets replayed over and over in my head was hearing my neighbor tell me over the phone, you're fucked. He went on to tell me there are police cars, fire trucks, ambulances all lit up and surrounding your apartment. Officers strapped to the nine are ripping your apartment apart with assault weapons drawn. Four people are in handcuffs in the front lawn. There is a search warrant with your name on it and Rob has already been taken to jail. The rest is really a blur. I don't even remember if I hung up the phone. Being told that, it's, it's, it, it's like a dream while free falling. Time stops in between heartbeats, pupils dilate, tunnel vision, depth perception, shot, lightheaded, cold. Your life flashes before your eyes with everything that's ever made you wince, cry, smile. The only thing you can feel is everything you have ever felt and in that second, nothing else matters. You're weightless. A traffic stop earlier that night resulted in the seizure of 3.5 grams of marijuana after the car was spotted leaving our place. The incident provided sufficient justification for a judge to issue a search warrant. Should have been taken to jail that night. Everyone should have. Rob's story serves the purpose of collateral damage. Officers physically assaulted him before taking him to jail. He was asleep when they came knocking. He was alone in the apartment. He's also Latino. Because Rob was the only person at home at the time the car was spotted leaving our apartment, he was taken to jail for a laundry list of charges and the distribution of marijuana. The police report would not reflect sufficient evidence to indict anyone on additional charges because the drug remnants of paraphernalia, among other things, were scattered throughout the apartment. My two other roommates and myself, all white, were never formally charged with anything. We were never questioned after that night, no felonies, no misdemeanors, no eviction. Rob's story is the result of systematic prejudice from the failed drug war and our factually void drug policies. I witnessed firsthand the packaging of a product of the system. I was told by police officers that they would not be following up with charges for anyone else because they had already had a conviction for the case. The fact that I was not in jail was, quote, a blessing from our judicial system. In talking about equity in the post-prohibition era, you have to have the conversation about how racism fuels the war on drugs as a direct result of cases that are handled just like this one. Or will we, as a privileged society, continue to view what happened that night as a blessing? <laughs>